So now I've got two little videos. One lasts for two minutes and the other lasts for one. And I'll show them straight off. They don't require a commentary. Here's the first one. Just to introduce it, many of you may have seen this. And if you haven't got it on your own laptop, please download this video and use it. Every dot represents a million people. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, you see things that are happening in the world. We're starting halfway through the video, around the end of the first millennium. You see already that the greatest concentration of humans is India and China, interestingly. But you only have a total population of 500 dots or so, 500 million in the world when this video starts. And nobody seems to be in Australia or in America, but that's just because you haven't got a million yet. You don't get a single dot on this map until you've got a million people, which actually is quite a lot of people. Shortly, you see some dots disappear in Europe. But that's the only time they disappear, in the sense that every year thereafter since, despite world wars, etc., there have always been more humans on the planet than the year before. the first thousand million in 1830. And Malthus, you remember, drew attention to the problem just before that, around now. And then it all takes off. Watch and see. I can never watch that little DVD, which you can get from YouTube very easily, Population Dots, without it sends my own pulse rate up in the same way as that. And if you look at it, you might say, well, let's go to Australia. But you folks, you know, Australia's already overcrowded because overpopulated, because the whole in the middle of Australia is desert. And in fact, the only black areas here are desert, or ice cap, or mountains, or rainforests, which we must preserve some of. You saw that before. Now, let's move on to the other little DVD, which is absolutely linked. It's called The Impossible Hamster. And you in this room will easily see the connection between the first DVD and this one. From birth to puberty, a hamster doubles its weight each week. If it didn't stop when mature, as animals do, and continue to double, on its first birthday, we would be staring at a nine billion ton hamster. <laughs> this hamster could eat all of the corn produced annually worldwide in a single day and still be hungry. <laughs> there is a reason why in nature Things grow in size only to a certain point. So why do most economists and politicians think that the economy can grow forever and ever and ever? <laughs> and that one you can get from impossiblehamster.org, which is a very good website. So, we can see the link. Somehow people are blind or being ostriches about the link between human numbers and uh, a, a philosophy of economic growth, which is not occurring in a vacuum, has to be done by consuming stuff, as uh, Roger said, and creating pollution. It's just not sustainable to go on the way we are. Growing world population will cause a perfect storm. 
That's a pretty bad storm, folks, a perfect storm of food, energy, and water shortages by 2030. That's a very short time ahead. These are facts, not opinions. We are accused, aren't we? All of us in this room, again, I'm, I'm not trying to preach the converted here. I'm trying to give us empowerment in our own talks to other people outside this room. People think these are our opinions and can therefore be neglected, don't they? Yet they're facts, incontrovertible facts. We have a finite planet. 70% of our planet is salt water, folks, you know that. Half of the rest is mountain desert ice cap. We're packing in 80 million highly, or intending to be highly consuming people every year on top. It's a dilemma we now face, which is quite stark. There is no choice about sustainability. The ultimate inconvenient truth is the planet is finite, Sustainability will happen. It's just a matter of how it happens, either by a massive increase in death rates or the gentle road of family planning on the left. And yet, isn't the whole subject a mammoth, the elephant in the room, that nobody talks about? Going back to that cartoon, Part of the problem, folks, has been the population zealots. There's no debate, and I hope none of us in this room are population zealots who go overboard and antagonize people. But there were such in India in the 1970s, in, in China uh, in the 80s when the one-child policy was brought in with a lot of untoward consequences for those societies. Part of the problem is those two words at the top population control. The very words, if you use them, talking to outsiders, people glaze over. They instantly think you mean India in the 70s, China now. They, they in immediately hear the word control, don't they? Will you join me in a little campaign from today, the 13th of October, 2012? None of us in this room will ever say population control. Again, will you agree to do that? Just don't put the words together. And more important, <coughs> When you hear somebody say it, always bite their head, well, not quite bite their head, but certainly always uh, say, look, we never say that, because it completely misleads. And it creates the taboo. It's part of the cause of the taboo. Those bad things that happened in the past, uh, very few of them, actually, but they've had a huge impact on people's thinking about the whole thing. So, please, let's never say those two words. Population matters. <laughs> or um, family planning. I don't mind a bit of a circumlocution, but just don't use the word control. I even try and avoid saying birth control. Stabilization. Is yes, a population stabilization, planned parenthood. There are lots of actual ways of saying it. And because the, the civil society of the world as a whole and uh, governments everywhere are only dealing with symptoms and not with root causes, so much of what we see on the TV and the radio, what we hear on the radio and read in the newspapers is like re rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, is it not? <laughs> <coughs> you may ask why I show this little clip, and the reason is to get myself off my soapbox, get us all off our soapbox, and start being a little less negative and depressing. Because it's hardly a bundle of laughs, is it? No. Uh, and don't worry, penguins love ice cold water. Yes. <laughs> it's only a game. So let's be a little, little bit more positive, get back to having a bit more of a light touch. Do you like this cartoon? You've probably seen that before. <coughs> Because fortunately, we're not dead yet, are we? We're close to midnight. Some of us have been in this business for four decades. Certainly I have, since I was a medical student at Cambridge and wasn't sure what branch of medicine to take up and decided then and there, after one lecture, that family planning was the most important branch of medicine. And I made sure I got trained in surgery so I could do vasectomies, of which I've done, our clinic's done 40,000 and I've done 5,000 of them. And uh, gynecology so I could work for, with women as well. And I did that just because of this concern. I think I'm the only doctor probably in the world who chose his career solely because he was so scared 
of the future of the planet through overpopulation. Right from the beginning. We're not going to do it by banning sex, are we? It's part of our animal nature. It's a lovely picture from the Kruger National Park. We are a unique species in lots of ways, some bad ones, but here's a, a splendid one. We're the only species that can still have our orgasms without having to have babies. That's what contraception is, folks. If anybody asks you, what's family planning? Say it loud and clear. Orgasms without babies. Could you think of anything better? Isn't that amazing? Fantastic technology. And these are the methods we've got in this country. Why can't the ordinary Rwandan, the ordinary Ugandan, uh, uh, inhabitants of Niger, use these methods that we are so lucky to have? Fifteen different methods. They're lucky if they've got one. And then their husband probably won't let them use it. Now, quickly, you know the IPAT equation. This, again, I'm speaking to people who are well informed. That actually nobody has ever managed to discover any more than these three factors in the environmental dilemma we have, the impact we have on the planet. There are only three, as Ehrlich and Holdren showed way back 40 years ago again. T for technology, it's greenness per person. A, affluence, and you can't have affluence without effluence, folks, so it's affluence plus effluence and consumption per person, and then P, the number of persons. We know this. It's still not being recognized outside. Okay, we want to reduce environmental impact, don't we, all of us? T for technology helps, but everybody knows it can't be the whole answer. For example, the fossil fuel alternatives, which get energy from the sun in real time, cannot compete against fossil fuels, which are 350 million years of solidified energy, uh, which we burn carelessly in, in a couple of hundred years, as we do, as we've done. So if T won't do it all, what about all of us reducing our affluence and per person consumption? That's what everybody majors upon in, this, in civil society, those who've understood there is an environmental problem. The difficulty is, folks, affluence, though it ought globally to come down, it ought also globally to go up because the only way out of poverty is by increasing affluence of the very poor. And nobody's discovered a way of getting out of poverty, of doing development, without using energy and creating uh, more greenhouse gases. Leave alone the unforgivable reluctance of the already affluent to consume less. So we have a strange situation where there are only three factors. One of them doesn't cut the mustard, it's not good enough. One of them is going to go up and absolutely will go up, whether we would like it or not, because the poor deserve to get out of poverty, surely. And so we're left with just the one that is the taboo one, the elephant in the room. When there are only three factors, how could it be we don't address all three? It's very odd to me. And we've all been saying it in this room for years. So anybody who will listen, there just aren't enough people out there listening, are there? 